Hello, everybody. This is for the week of April 27th through May 1st, our last week. And let's turn this week to religion and law. I initially had two weeks set aside for this, and I had to kind of condense this one. Um, obviously, we lost a week. So let's, yeah, let's talk about chapters 11 and 12 of uh, our main book uh, today. And then let's look at some of the cases that we see in our reader uh, on the next class. So yeah, how does the Supreme Court actually work as an institution? Uh, just a little bit of overview. The court uh, does not aggressively go after cases to decide. No, it waits for cases to come to it. It is a passive institution in that way. It doesn't tell the public or any uh, public officials what it will rule beforehand. You only know what the court will rule when it does rule. It nearly always hears cases on appeal from lower courts. And so there is a petitioner and a respondent, the one who brings the court, uh, brings the case to the court and the one that responds to it. Every single Supreme Court case is so-and-so versus so-and-so. So think Brown versus Board, Roe versus Wade. It's always uh, deciding between two parties. Uh, at the level of the highest uh, federal courts, though, the question is not obviously the guilt or innocence of somebody as it is in a lower criminal court, or is it a, nor is it a civil suit. The question here is when the law itself is on trial and is a state or local law uh, constitutional. If the Supreme Court declares that it is not constitutional, what does that mean? Does the court mean to say that it's a bad law? No, the court is saying that it is void. It is no law at all. And that's what the court has been doing since all the way back in Marbury versus Madison uh, in, the, in the early Republic. It declares laws void. That means that they have no force of law. That means they're just gone. Um, and so the court, as we know, has been very involved with religion. It has quite a bit to say about religion, at least in the since the mid 20th century. So let's uh, talk about uh, the way that judicial politics plays into the religion and politics question. Look at the way uh, the various groups that are involved in bringing suits before the U.S. Supreme Court involving religion. And then let's look at some of the major cases uh, and kind of the doctrines that have emerged. I don't expect you to know all of the cases, but just kind of know the doctrines and the, the general principles that the court has laid out when it comes to the church and state question, as well as free exercise. And then, like I said, we'll look at some of the cases next time. So let's turn to religion and law. Gallup asked this fascinating question a few years ago in 2007. Uh, suppose you were asked to draft a new constitution for a new country. Uh, as you look through the list of possible provisions, what do you think is most important, at least when it comes to individual rights? Uh, and by far, the biggest concerns are free speech. 93% of people said that was their biggest concern. And freedom of religion, 91% said that was their biggest concern. So yeah, we hold these freedoms uh, very dear. We take them very seriously. At the same time, uh, we don't just look at religious freedom as a matter of individual protection and the right to uh, the right to your own belief. Uh, people, uh, Americans, especially white evangelicals, the biggest group, have a very strong tendency to say that uh, religion should be a source of American law. And historically speaking, that's really true. Uh, religion has done a lot, especially Christianity has done a lot to shape law in the United States in certain ways. When evangelicals say this, this question was asked in 2019, they can mean different things by it. Does that mean that religion informs law, that it should be some source of law, or that it's the main source of law? 17% of white evangelicals said that, as did 17% of Protestants. A, a much bigger margin, though, of evangelicals are willing to say that it should be some source of law. So in other words, the Bible doesn't directly dictate civil law. Instead, it shapes it in some way. Uh, well, 27% of those white evangelicals said no. And so uh, Muslims, only 12% say yes, while 33% say no, which is very intriguing because Islam as a revealed religion is uh, much like Judaism, and they're even lower. Uh, they are uh, keenly concerned with providing the law that's necessary for shaping society. Uh, but still in the United States, no, it's the white evangelicals that seem to take the hardest line on that question. Fascinating graph. What about the makeup of the Supreme Court itself? If you talk about the whole federal judiciary, that's too complicated. I'm not sure there's data on that. But as far as the Supreme Court, for much of its history, it was predominantly Protestant. 11.4% um, Catholic, just a handful of Roman Catholics, only 7% uh, Jewish. And there's some prominent Jewish uh, judges on the U.S. Supreme Court. Think Louis Brandeis, 
um, and, a, and a handful of others. But for the most part, yeah, they've been one form of Protestant or another. That's shifted dramatically uh, in more recent years. These days, we see that uh, Roman Catholics are the biggest majority of the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, there are a handful of Jews, think Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, think, um, uh, what's her name? The Obama appointee, I can't say her name, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, there's only about 11% of our Protestant. Uh, most recently, Neil Gorsuch uh, is, uh, I think, Episcopalian background. Elena Kagan, that's her name. I blanked out. Um, so yeah, but still, as far as like the, the religious makeup of the Supreme Court, uh, judges certainly bring a great deal of their you know, religious identity to what they do, but their real task is to decide the law as objectively as possible. And it's very rare that you see justices weigh in on religious questions from their own point of view. Uh, Felix Frankfurter did this, as we'll see with the, um, the Jehovah's Witness cases, uh, talked about what it's like to be uh, Jewish, especially during World War II, how does he feel for a bunch of Jehovah's Witnesses persecuted for not saying the Pledge of Allegiance? He doesn't really feel too bad for them being Jewish himself. Um, so yeah, once in a while, you, you'll hear them say something about their faith. But for the most part, when it comes to deciding cases, no, they're just keenly focused on the statute and whether or not it's constitutional. What are the levers of power when it comes to judicial politics? This is true of all interest groups, not just religious ones. Uh, it's, of course, hiring attorneys who will bring your case before the court. Uh, and argue it. It's also hiring attorneys who will write amicus briefs. Amicus briefs are, of course, the friend of the court briefs. Uh, and every time there's some important case before a court, whether state or federal or the Supreme Court at the highest level, uh, briefs are necessary for explaining to the justices why they should rule one way or another. And uh, they are written reports. Uh, and a whole bunch of briefs will come in for the petitioner. A whole bunch of briefs will come in for the respondent. Uh, making the case for why the court should rule in their favor. And uh, the, sometimes the court will read some of the major ones. A lot of times they don't get any attention. Uh, but still, the fact that a lot of these interest groups can hire attorneys to do this is one of their major fundraising uh, points that they can say that we were involved. So yeah, we'll talk about some of the, um, uh, some of the interest groups later who, in, who are involved in this. But what about the First Amendment itself? James Madison, we talked about earlier, is largely responsible for drafting the First Amendment. And remember, it was a compromise with the Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists said that they would not agree to ratify the Constitution unless there was a Bill of Rights. Of course, some said they'll never ratify it, but the ones that were willing to compromise said, okay, if you give us a Bill of Rights, we will consider it. James Madison said, okay, true to his word, the first Congress met and Madison went to work drafting several uh, versions of the First Amendment. And you can get a clear sense of what he was trying to do when you look at the wording here. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise there thereof, said the August 24th draft. But then it went on, nor shall the rights of conscience be infringed. Uh, conscience, though, everybody thought, well, that's a little too broad. And indeed, conscience can include atheists. We don't want to protect them. And so that was dropped. September 9th, he came back with another draft. How about this? Congress shall make no law respecting articles of faith or mode of worship or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. I uh, don't know about that. And so uh, he went back to the drawing board and finally came up with the words that we're more familiar with in our First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then it goes on with free speech and free press and assembly and those other rights in the First Amendment. But yeah, there's the religion clauses. Notice how they're balanced against each other legally. On one hand, Congress cannot uh, make any law respecting an establishment of religion. So obviously no national church. Right? There's no Church of America. Can you imagine? No, there'll never be such a thing. Uh, nor uh, will it pick favorites among religious groups. At the same time, balanced against that, it will never do anything prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So Congress, on one hand, will not favor religious groups, nor will it do anything to take away the free exercise. And so all the Supreme Court cases can be put in those two categories, establishment and free exercise. And so we'll start with uh, free exercise first, when we look at the cases and then establishment. But it's, it's a great question, though. What is the primary thing here? What was uh, James Madison and the first Congress really trying to protect? What was, was it free exercise or was it non-establishment? 
Uh, the two things fit together in some important ways, obviously, but what was their real priority? How did then the Bill of Rights become a national issue? How did religion become a national issue as it appears in uh, the First Amendment? Well, it was largely because of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was passed by the Republican Congress and ratified by the states right after the Civil War as one of the major Reconstruction Amendments. And it was designed, you can tell, to protect former slaves. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they reside. So there, for the first time, the Constitution defines citizenship. It's all persons born or naturalized. They shall be citizens. It nationalizes what it means to be an American. Prior to that time, you were primarily a citizen of your state. Uh, Congress could pass laws to extend the definition of citizenship, and they did when it came to foreign affairs. But uh, as far as the Constitution, it, it didn't really say. But then there's this. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the several states. That restates Article 4 of the original Constitution, privileges and immunities. Um, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That restates the Fifth Amendment in the original Bill of Rights. Then it goes on to protect equal protection. That's, of course, the civil rights principle. So you tell due process is about liberty, equal protection is about civil rights and equality. Uh, but still, that due process clause, the way it's worded, uh, the court comes to read that by the 20th century as incorporating or making national the Bill of Rights. Prior to this time, you could not sue your state or local government under the, the Bill of Rights because it only applied to the national government. But then again, the national government would never do anything that it was thought uh, would infringe on your, your rights listed in the Bill of Rights. It only did national things. So it was just sort of a non-issue. The Bill of Rights was practically decoration in the Constitution. With the 14th Amendment, though, it does become a national concern, and the Supreme Court does get very involved. The earliest cases had more to do with free speech. Uh, a lot of them had to do with freedom of contract uh, under the Due Process Clause. Uh, for a lot of years, though, the court didn't really address the Bill of Rights so much, and it paid most of its attention to the New Deal. Uh, what happened, of course, with the New Deal court, you probably know the story, the, new, the, the court struck down several of the major New Deal laws, especially uh, those that created the National Recovery Administration, which was the uh, agency entrusted with ending the Great Depression. They struck it down, though, saying that it was an unconstitutional delegation of legislative authority to the executive, plus it was an abuse of the Commerce Clause. Well, as we know, Franklin Roosevelt turned right around and threatened to pack the court and said he was going to put a whole bunch of other justices on the court, raise the number to 15 uh, to try to basically strong arm the court to not strike down any more of his laws. He proposed his suggestion to the U.S. Senate. The Senate rejected it, but still the court got the message. This is what brought about the rights revolution. This is when the court turned away from big, broad questions of national power and commerce and all these kind of economic questions and turned instead to rights, individual rights, as well as civil rights, Brown versus Board of Education, women's rights and reproductive freedom, and, as, and then later uh, gay rights by the 1980s and 90s. So now the court is in the business of protecting rights. And the, you see this dramatic shift in their approach to law and everything they were doing. Questions of national power and federalism are still around, but they kind of fall by the wayside compared to the increasing question of rights. So yeah, uh, along with those rights were, of course, religious rights and all the free, uh, the First Amendment, free exercise and non-establishment challenges that came before the Supreme Court, and they agreed and agreed and agreed to hear them. Along with that, through the course of the 20th century is the growing uh, pluralism that we mentioned before. Now, minor religious groups, Jehovah's Witnesses, who we'll talk about next time, the Church of Scientology, uh, people who practice voodoo and Santeria, all kinds of very... Uh, small and often unknown religions become much more prominent because of their challenges in the U.S. Supreme Court. A lot of times in the case of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, these are religions that don't get involved in politics. They don't vote. They are not civically engaged, but they do get involved in law. So we'll come back to some of their stories as we move along. 
In general, though, what has the court actually given us when it comes to um, religious uh, freedom and the First Amendment interpretation? They have been very unclear and inconsistent. <laughs> so that's probably what John Roberts is thinking in this photo. <laughs> We've been unclear. And it's true, actually. Roberts is actually quite troubled by the precedents that he and his fellow justices are handed down. Um, by uh, members of the court who were there years and years before. And we'll see the inconsistencies and how confusing they can get. Because the court is inconsistent though, this is, of course, oh, this leads to a lot more litigation, a lot more people bringing suits. And so we see the graph where the numbers of cases for establishment and free exercise challenges go up and up and up across the years. This is from uh, religious, religious news service. Um, and uh, so, too, we see lots of local uh, laws. Think of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in all the states. There's Mike Pence when he was governor of Indiana signing it into law. We mentioned, too, how I think the state of South Carolina in recent years proposed reestablishing religion in their state. Uh, because the court is so dubious on a lot of these questions, states, state legislatures say, hey, let's see what we can do. And then the litigation comes pouring in. So, yeah. Uh, lack of clarity from the U.S. Supreme Court results in a flurry of legal as well as legislative activity coming from the states. We'll come back to that. You can divide uh, interpretations of the, the uh, religious, the, the First Amendment question into two major camps. There are, of course, the separationists and the, the accommodationists. The separationists can trace their heritage back to Roger Williams and his famous little essay, The Bloody Tenant of Persecution. Roger Williams is the first figure to use that image of the wall separating church and state uh, in those kind of terms. Though it's very clear when he referred to the wall, as the book points out, what is the wall meant to protect? The state? No, the church, or more specifically, faith that is easily corrupted and overtaken by the corruption of politics and power. No, the wall needs to protect the sweet inner life of faith. Williams uh, said this from a great deal of personal experience. Remember, he fled Massachusetts Bay Colony because he challenged certain Puritan doctrines and they were ready to put him in the stocks and beat him up and maybe execute him. He fled to Rhode Island. And of course, Rhode Island became the safe haven for all kinds of obscure religious minorities coming from Europe because Roger Williams was willing to protect them. His essay, though, uh, Bloody Tenant, had this to say, a civil sword as woeful experience in all ages has proven, by the sword he means the power of government, secular power, is so far from bringing or helping forward an opposition in religion to repentance that magistrates sin grievously against the work of God and blood of souls by such proceedings. And any civil magistrate who tries to force religious conformity with law and civil power is himself sinning grievously. No, religion cannot be true which needs, needs such instruments of violence to uphold it. He doesn't just sin against the people he persecutes. He sins against true religion because true religion does not need violence. God needeth not the help of the material sword of steel to assist the sword of the spirit in the, in the affairs of conscience. And so, yeah, this uh, little essay of his was very popular, that true religion does not need power. It just needs persuasion. That religious tolerance might allow for all kinds of falsehood in religion, but hey, let it run its course, let people talk it out, and the truth will prevail. No surprise, Roger Williams was one of the all-time favorites of Thomas Jefferson. We said a lot about Jefferson before and his role in disestablishment, so we won't dwell on him too much here, uh, but he too picked up that very same phrase from Roger Williams, the wall of separation between church and state, and uh, used it in that famous little letter we discussed to the Danbury Baptists where he said that the great thing about religion in America is that there's a wall between church and state. Um, and again, what did Jefferson mean by that? It was sort of a mix of protecting the state from religion. It was also protecting religion from the state, that it was good for both uh, from Jefferson's point of view. Uh, but still, that phrase has a very unusual set of twists and turns through American history. What's really peculiar, and a lot of people don't know this, and it's very surprising, who advocated the most for separation of church and state? It was actually religious people in the earlier, uh, through the 19th and into the 20th century. And the most uh, prominent advocate of separation was the Baptists, the Southern Baptists. Now, Baptists did this back in the old days, in the colonial times, 
specifically because they tended to be the mo one of the most per persecuted groups around. And so separation meant protection for them. Over time, though, what happened to the Southern Baptists? Well, as we know, they grew to the point where they became the largest single Protestant denomination in the country. We've talked about them a lot already. But suddenly the, se the significance of separation changes in the way they understand things by the 20th century. Now, separation isn't so much protection for them as it is, as it is a way to keep Roman Catholics out of American politics. And indeed, Southern Baptists were very much opposed to Roman Catholics. Aligned in a lot of ways with the old time Baptists, not anymore, but back then, was of course the most notorious nativist group in American history, the Ku Klux Klan. I'm surprised the book didn't go into this, but the Klan was actually very obsessed with the concept of separation of church and state. Again, not used against them, because they were big on their Christian identity, understood, of course, in very racist, uh, white nationalist sense. But you see the Klansman sitting on the Pope, defeated, holding his holy Bible. He doesn't open it. He doesn't read passages like, do unto others as you would do unto them, you know. But instead, waving it around as a symbol of white Protestant American identity. But if you look at the Klan creeds from, uh, you know, late 19th, early 20th centuries in the 1920s, look at uh, clause number six on the, the statement, why I am a Klansman, because there it is separation of church and state and free public schools is a part of the constitution of the united states the free public schools part maybe separation of church and state if you want to read the first amendment that way but where are they getting this indeed though the clan was very obsessed with separation you see it in the Klansman's creed uh you see it about the uh, fourth clause there it's very small but i believe in the eternal eternal separation of church and state what did this mean for the Klan? Well, in their minds, there was this understanding that they could separate church and state in their minds because they were Protestants. Roman Catholics, of course, couldn't. And you, see, you always see separation of church and state mentioned right alongside public schools. The public schools were sort of the ideal environment for cultivating American Protestant identity. We'll see, though, what that means in coming years as the Klan kind of fades away when it comes to school prayer. Uh, the fact that prayer as well as Bible reading becomes so embedded in the environment of public schools that no one sees them as religious. That's one of the unusual legacies of this line of thinking, uh, the Klan as well as the Baptists. Who are the separationists today? The Anti-Defamation League is big on this idea, uh, which is largely concerned with uh, defending uh, Jews against anti-Semitism, but they also get very much in the business of a strict separation against um, conservative evangelicals and their sway over American politics and law. Of course, the American Civil Liberties Union is very involved in this as well um, and uh, has brought several Establishment Clause challenges to the federal courts, and many of them have appealed all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And so the ACLU is fundamentally concerned with not so much secularism as opposing religion, so much as it is keeping out of public influence uh, when it comes to symbols, we'll see the Ten Commandments cases uh, and things like that. But then you have the secularists who are more, not so much about individual civil liberties, but more secularism uh, as a matter of just getting religion out completely of public life from the point of view of atheism and non-belief. And the two biggest organizations out there are Freedom From Religion Foundation as well as the Secular Coalition for America. And uh, they have brought several suits uh, before before the federal courts, challenging all kinds of expressions of religion in public spheres. Um, it was the Freedom From Religion Foundation that brought the case against George W. Bush's faith-based initiatives. And uh, they lost because the initiatives weren't directly funding religious organizations, the court said. Uh, but still, these, uh, these outfits get a lot of attention from their donors, and they cause a lot of uh, news. Freedom From Religion Foundation is a really interesting organization. It was founded by this mother and daughter, the Gaylers, and uh, they were fundamentally concerned about ridding uh, society of uh, the influence of religion. Uh, so Marie Gaylor, the daughter, uh, is married to Dan Barker, who's kind of their lead spokesman these days. And uh, he's more of a kind of philosopher, public speaker. He does public debates and that kind of thing. But Freedom from Religion Foundation also has a very big uh, legal defense wing. And they've been quite involved in a lot of the litigation uh, in the federal courts.
So those are the separationists, ranging from separation for the sake of protecting religion to separation for the sake of squashing religion. There's a whole spectrum there. But what are, what's the other side? Well, these are, of course, the accommodationists. The accommodationists are big on the fact that uh, religion has had this sort of active presence and important role in American life um, that separation kind of misses and overlooks. Consider the Northwest Ordinance back in 1787, the only major law passed by the uh, Congress as it existed under the Articles of Confederation, governing the Northwest Territories up around the Great Lakes. But it had this one statement that religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. And it offered, uh, you know, federal money to do that. Didn't have a lot because the Congress didn't have a power to tax. But still, you saw as a statement that as far as the federal government is concerned, Religion is blended together with morality and knowledge, as it was understood in 1787, and these things ought to be encouraged out in the federal territories. Uh, Joseph, uh, another example of this is really intriguing, and one of you is uh, going to present on this, but I'll do it. Was a little supreme, a little uh, court case in the in the New York Supreme Court, not a federal case, the case of People v. Ruggles. John Ruggles was a local atheist. And he went on this sort of speaking tour around the state where he would get up on a stump and start blaspheming, not trying to persuade anyone, but more just trying to shock polite society. And supposedly the words that got him in the most trouble were, Jesus was a bastard and his mother was a whore. And supposedly when he said it, people in the audience said, no, don't say it, Mr. Ruggles, God's going to strike you dead. And of course, God did. And he said, see, there's no God. And everyone's just exasperated. And then the police showed up and finally arrested him for disturbing the peace, but also for blaspheming. Indeed, there were anti-blasphemy laws. Uh, this happened in 1811. Well, his case appealed to the state, uh, state Supreme Court, and Judge James Kent wrote the opinion and actually defended the state for prosecuting this guy for blasphemy. Why? Here's Kent. The court considers those blasphemous words uttered with such an intent as to breach public morals, right? Not just public peace. He wasn't just trying to start a fight or start a riot. No, public morals. He was challenging the core assumptions that underlay the common law. They were indictable on the same principle as the act of wantonly going naked in public or committing impure and indecent acts in the public streets, right? So it wasn't like he committed an immoral act. He caused immoral assumptions to appear in the public mind by saying these things. It was not because Christianity was established by law, no, but because Christianity was in fact the religion of this country, the rule of our faith and practice and the basis of our public morals, right? So it's back to that unconventional partners thesis. It's back to what William Jennings Bryan had, had to say in the essay we looked at last time, that religion is the thing that keeps up public morals. Maybe not private morals. Sure, atheists could be moral, fine. But public morals, no, that depends very much on religion. And so to challenge the key ideas of our religion the way Ruggles did, that's a direct problem for society. Now, nope, Kent says, such blasphemy was an outrage upon public decorum and is sanctioned by our tribunals, which shock the moral sense of our country and degrade our character as a Christian people. So you're done. Supposedly Ruggles served like one night in jail and paid a hundred dollar fine and that was it. But still, uh, the fact that Kent saw religion as so central to everything we were as a society uh, really shows a lot of what the accommodationists mean to argue. Other aspects of accommodationism. Um, after the Civil War, there were attempts, I mean, before the Civil War, but especially after, there were attempts to try to convert Native Americans to Christianity. And all these missionaries would go out to the frontier because uh, the belief was that Christianity would prepare them for assimilation into American society. And of course, as we know, that turned out to be a lot harder than expected. But still, the federal government funded Ulysses Grant's administration, paid for these missionaries to go out and try to spread Christianity to Native American tribes. It was shut down, though, because Roman Catholic missionaries also got involved. Uh, Grant, as you know, was really anti-Catholic. He was all caught up in the anti-Catholic scare of that era. Uh, and a lot of the missionaries themselves said, hey, we can't compete with the Jesuits. They're way more effective at evangelizing Native Americans. So examples then are all over the place. Accommodationists can summon all kinds of historical characters and 
current practices of religion deeply embedded in our public life. Um, they appeal to certain aspects of civil religion that are indeed civil in the sense that they incorporate uh, all religious traditions, but at the same time, they borrow distinct things from Christianity. Who are the current accommodationists? Probably one of the oldest groups around is the Christian Legal Society, been around since the 1960s. Uh, they're mostly a legal society for Christians who are in law school or in uh, the practice of law. Uh, in recent years, they've become more involved in litigation. There were, of course, the major interest groups, back to Jerry Falwell and the Moral Majority, Beverly Hay, Hay and Concerned Women for America, that themselves were just interest groups. They were trying to lobby, they were trying to persuade public opinion, and along with all of that, they got involved in litigation as well. They could do the fundraising and hire attorneys. They could write amicus briefs and present their cases in court, okay. But then there are a handful of uh, religious interest groups that are directly and entirely concerned with uh, litigation. One of them is the ACLJ. It was founded back in the 1990s, the American Center for Law and Justice. Jay Sekulow, there he is, is their, their longtime president. He's been president for years of this organization. He's argued many cases in the U.S. Supreme Court representing all kinds of people. And uh, they really aggressively go after laws and uh, rules and school board codes and all kinds of things that seem to show hostility toward religious groups, primarily conservative evangelicals. You really see evangelicals going on the offensive here. Back to that graph we looked at a minute ago. Um, they seem to think that religion should play a substantial role in civil law. Uh, ACLJ definitely recognizes that, and they've been pretty successful bringing lots of litigation uh, before courts. The other major organization is, of course, the Alliance to Defend Freedom. And uh, this is the legal wing of Focus on the Family. We mentioned the conservative uh, group headed up by um, uh, James Dobson. But yeah, Alliance to Defend Freedom has been immensely successful too, uh, defending all kinds of uh, people, especially businesses, most of them in trouble with state civil rights codes for not accommodating same-sex marriage. The florist in uh, Washington State, uh, the Sweet Cakes case coming out of Oregon, and of course, I'm sure you know his story, Jack Phillips, uh, who brought the challenge, uh, saying uh, brought the challenge against the Cal Colorado Civil Rights Code for refusing to bake a cake for a same-sex couple. And so, yeah, these organizations really are on the forefront of uh, defending religious liberty, but more specifically for prominent uh, evangelical Protestants. It's Again, it's an interesting twist of what's happened here. Go back to Jerry Falwell's day. And here you see, uh, there, back then you saw uh, religi uh, religious evangelicals really on going on the offensive. Falwell, as far as, far as I know, never talked about religious liberty. That wasn't the issue for him. No, the issue was taking back America for God. Now you see it flipped for conservative evangelicals. Now they are much more on the defensive. And that's why the ACLJ, as well as the Alliance to Defend Freedom, have really uh, become these prominent organizations. And the number one issue, definitely at the top, as we see, is same-sex marriage. So, separationists and accommodationists going very two different directions in their understanding of things. Let's look at some of the case law. Uh, let's start, of course, with the free exercise clause. Um, and uh, it's you could probably argue based historically that the free exercise clause is the primary concern of the First Amendment, more than non-establishment, that in a way non-establishment exists for the sake of free exercise. And that's uh, you know deeply rooted in the American tradition that we value the free exercise of religion. We value toleration, a lot of toleration for a variety of religious traditions. Now true, toleration sometimes breaks when it comes to Mormons in the 1830s and 40s, when it comes to Muslims after 9-11, uh, yeah, we find our threshold for tolerance pretty easily. But still, as a matter of principle, uh, we still believe that we should be allowed to worship according to the dictates of our own conscience, to quote Thomas Jefferson. Um, so, okay, so what are the major free exercise challenges that have come up? Uh, we'll talk about Reynolds versus United States next time. That was the first major free exercise case to come before the court dealing with Mormon polygamy. But yeah, in the 20th century, the first one was this really kind of hilarious case that's one of my favorites. U.S. v. Ballard. Guy Ballard and his wife Edna founded this uh, movement 
which they didn't call a movement. They didn't call it a religion. They called it an activity. It was called the I am activity. And it involved this sort of meditation technique where if you repeat it to yourself, I am, you know, enough times, I am, of course, is what God said to Moses through the burning bush. When Moses said, who do I say you are? I am who am. Well, Guy Bowler took that to the extreme and said, yeah, if you believe that you are, then you basically become a god. And it, none of his religion made any sense. It was a lot of a lot of hocus pocus. But he was actually very successful, though, spreading this around through the U.S. mail. Well, 1944, some state officials in Texas caught up with him as this kind of fraud. Uh, it's, of course, 1944 is an intense year because it's the invasion of Normandy that summer, World War II. Uh, and this guy was taking advantage of a lot of people, a lot of uh, wives at home whose husbands were overseas, and that, you know, a lot of public animosity suddenly turns against him in Texas. His attorney turns around and says, ha, wait a second, you can't question my, my uh, client's religious beliefs because there's a wall separating church and state. It doesn't say it in the Constitution. Well, yeah, but we all know that's what it means. He just appeals to that phrase that's so common. And because of that phrase... Because of the wall, you can't question my client's beliefs. Yeah, we'll see about that. It appeals, though, to the federal level. It goes to a federal district court because he was using the mail, the postal service, to distribute his leaflets about the IM activity. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a very hilarious case. But what's really intriguing about it is you see the Supreme Court right off the bat, 1944, one of the earliest religion cases, refusing to even define religion uh they and so that one of the uh the opinion written by william o douglas an fdr appointee was the religious views espoused by the respondent might seem incredible if not preposterous to most people but if those doctrines are subject to trial before a jury charged with the findings they're finding their truth or falsity then the same could be done with the religious beliefs of any sect I mean, really, Douglas says, what's the difference between Guy Ballard's religion and revealed Christianity or Judaism or Islam? You know, it, it's all just it's all just belief, right? Douglas was really big on this point in several other cases. He really thought that religion was undefinable. It was up to the individual to define for themselves. So that means whatever you believe, even if you make it up, even if it's total hogwash, you still have a right to it under the free exercise clause. Now, he says, when the triers of fact undertake that task they enter forbidden domain the first amendment does not select any one group or any one type of religion for for, for, for preferred treatment nope it puts them all in that position that all spiritual beliefs no matter how strange they might be are equally protected consider a similar situation with l ron hubbard and the church of scientology uh, uh, scientology was uh, receiving a tax exemption and someone argued actually no the commissioner in, uh, I forget which state it was, one of the states, the tax commissioner said, no, 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 the Church of Scientology is not really a religion. So therefore they can't claim a tax exemption. Come on. I mean, you look at a revealed religion like Christianity or Judaism or Islam or even Mormonism or something like that. Okay, those are kind of established religions, but not Scientology. Now, of course, when the tax commissioner said that, he knew something about the history of Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard, who founded it, the legend goes, was a very successful science fiction writer um, and uh, But then he was really upset with the amount of uh, taxes he had to pay, federal and state, on his earnings. And then he realized, hey, I see a way out of this. I'm going to make up a religion. And the legend goes, that's what Scientology basically is. It's L. Ron Hubbard's made-up religion to avoid paying his federal taxes. And he got it. Uh, tax commissioner said, no, nah, you know, we're not buying that in this state. I went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court said, well, no, uh, if Scientologists believe that it's a religion, then it is. And so it too, much like Guy Ballard, was protected. So, and again, the willingness to define what's a religion and what's not, the court has consistently refused to do that. This has a lot to do with the cults. We mentioned them earlier in the semester, the, the Branch Davidians and all the strange and unusual and kind of scary cults in the United States. Uh, because of these precedents, they are protected until they engage in overtly destructive criminal behavior of some kind. Uh, they are protected in their belief. And uh, no matter how many warning signs they put up, their protection is, is there. What are some of the other protections, though? One of the most intriguing ones has to do, when it comes to free exercise, with clerical confidentiality. 
And here's one of the few instances where the court actually makes a distinction between what kinds of religious leaders are protected from uh, testifying under oath or being subpoenaed in a criminal case and which ones aren't. As it stands, every other kind of religious leader, if he knows something about what one of his members is up to involved in, involving criminal behavior, he must testify before court, except if he is a Catholic priest. They receive, and they, for, for most of American history, they have received very special legal protections. Why? Because the sacrament of confession is a sacrament. Because it's understood within Catholic doctrine that if a priest ever divulges the information he hears from someone in confession, that could just condemn his soul. And so it's, it's understood that way. Now, of course, priests have an easy time doing this. They're not gossipy. Of course, you hear enough confessions over the years, really seasoned confessors. They've heard it all. You can't shock them, right? But still, uh, they are protected by law from ever testifying. Whereas a Protestant minister, an evangelical pastor, a rabbi, uh, they are obligated to testify under oath. Now, usually courts avoid doing this kind of thing anyway. Um, they won't put a rabbi or a pastor on the stand. Usually there's enough evidence to gather for a criminal conviction anyway. So uh, protections for clergy then. Protections get trickier, though, when you start talking about public health and safety. Um, vaccinations. Uh, when the vaccine for polio and all kinds of diseases was developed, it was understood in a lot of the states that this is critical for public health. Uh, and so the states were very serious about vac vaccinations for kids as early as possible to prevent all kinds of diseases. What about, though, those who dissent? Jehovah's Witnesses in particular and several others. Uh, are we going to force them to take vaccines for the sake of public health? As it stands, the Supreme Court years ago, as uh, in the 1920s, I think, ruled, uh, indeed, states can force them to get vaccinations. But a lot of states have actually uh, decided that they will carve out exemptions for groups like Jehovah's Witnesses voluntarily uh, within their own state laws. Um, and so that's where it currently stands. Of course, today there's a new anti-vaccine movement, only it has nothing to do with religion. Instead, it's the conspiracy theories that uh, vaccines cause uh, autism in small children when they receive them, especially as babies. Um, and if there's a big fight over whether or not that's true. But what about the question, though, of snake handling? That has never risen to the level of a federal court, never been in the Supreme Court. But as far as a lot of uh, state courts, they have ruled that indeed states can uh, forbid the practice of Pentecostal snake handling. Of course, they read that passage uh, when Jesus says, you know, they'll handle serpents and not be bitten and they take it very seriously. And so they handle dangerous serpents. There have been some criminal convictions uh, of people who uh, were handling snakes or one, one situation, uh, the pastor was handed the snake before he was ready and it bit him and he had to be rushed to the hospital and they had to, I think, amputate his hand or something like that because of the snake bite. Um, okay, what about that? As it stands though, uh, a lot of the states have agreed, no, this is contrary to public safety, but they kind of look the other way. It turns out to be sort of an unenforceable law. So uh, vaccines, yes, snake handling, no, <laughs> that's where it stands. But it raises all kinds of fascinating questions. I mean, if public health is at risk here, can people really hide behind uh, religious beliefs? We're hearing a lot about this recently, aren't we? With COVID-19 and the fact that Easter especially, and then the, the few Sundays since then, a lot of the big congregations and mega churches around the country have insisted on having their uh, meetings regardless of the threat to public health. So yeah, it's an enduring question. One of the most fascinating Supreme Court cases uh, to ever come along having to do with religion was Pierce versus Society of Sisters back in 1928. What happened here? The Oregon State Assembly got together and passed a law mandating that all the kids in Oregon attend public schools. This law was heavily backed by the Oregon Ku Klux Klan, trying to stick it, sure enough, to the Catholic schools. So you really see that they're anti-Catholicism throughout. Well, what happened? It appealed, the uh, Catholic schools, the archdiocese there in Oregon appealed it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And guess who the court ruled for? The Catholic schools. On the basis of the free exercise clause? Actually, no. Willis Van Ruven, or sorry, James Reynolds, it was James Reynolds, wrote the opinion. And here he said, Catholic schools have business and property for which they claim protection. Notice, not free exercise. That wasn't the issue for him. 
These are threatened with destruction through the unwarranted compulsion which appellants are exercising over present and prospective patrons of their schools. And this court has gone very far to protect against loss threatened by such action. What is the real damage done to them? It's not to their religious liberty of the parents, of the kids, of the nuns. No, it's a violation of contract and property. Indeed, McReynolds understood it in terms of economics and economic freedom. Why not the First Amendment? That just wasn't the issue for him. He refers to the way the court has gone very far to protect against these losses. That's true. This was the era of the what's called the laissez-faire Supreme Court. They protected freedom of contract and property all over the place against all kinds of state legislatures. Uh, along with all those protections, though, was, sure enough, the right of Catholic schools, understood in purely economic terms. So it really makes you wonder, couldn't we understand other religious liberty challenges in much the same way? Why not? The other very interesting free exercise case was Wisconsin v. Oder in 1972. Similar law in the state of Wisconsin mandated that all children attend public schools. Now they did, they were flexible. They said, okay, only up to eighth grade, just because we want to make sure that everybody has the same standards. Well, who brought suit? The Amish families that said, no, 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 we understand how we educate our kids best. Although notice the departure that happened from Pierce versus Society of Sisters. It was not understood in economic contract terms. It was understood in religious terms and the right to religious education. The precedent in the Yoder case applied once again to all the other expressions of religious education. This is the main protection that we see when it comes to uh, religious parochial schools, of religious universities. Uh, they are heavily protected by federal law. Now, the question of whether or not they can use public tax money to pay their tuition, that's a separate question we'll come back to. But as far as the protection of their existence, of the right of parents to educate kids the way they see fit, it's protected under Yoder. And all these red flags go up. Well, what if the parents have no idea what they're doing educating their kids? What if they're homeschooling not because they want to teach them well, but because they want to indoctrinate them in religious fundamentalism or something like that? Supreme Court says, sorry, it doesn't matter. It's up to the parents. What is the major challenge uh, happening with the free exercise of religion in recent years? It has, of course, been its collision with other rights, especially other rights perceived as fundamental. The court itself has fueled a lot of this problem, especially when it comes to contraception. Go back to Grizzle versus Connecticut in 1963, where the Supreme Court ruled that there is, in fact, a right to birth control. Specifically, though, if you read Griswold, for who? Individuals? No, married couples. Now that changes quickly through the 1970s. Later cases say, well, okay, individuals and then everybody. Uh, but still, there's a fundamental right established by the court, the right to privacy it's based on. At the same time, there's the free exercise and the, the fundamental right to religious free exercise. These two things have come on a serious collision course. And the most recent episode was the contraceptive mandate through the Affordable Care Act under, uh, under Barack Obama's administration. The contraceptive mandate wasn't part of the actual federal law. It was a presidential mandate. It was basically Obama applying part of the law as he thought fit as president. Now, much to his credit, Obama thought really hard about this. This wasn't just a whim. A lot of his critics thought that he was just sort of coming after religious groups. That wasn't true. No, he did think seriously about the question, but what it actually meant was private employers have to cover insurance policies that include birth control. Now, for most employers, who cares? It's not a, not a problem for them. But what about some religious organizations that do not want to pay for contraception, especially if that form of contraception they believe is an abortifacient, or if it's just contraception in general? So uh, these questions came before the U.S. Supreme Court in a couple of major cases, but you see the position taken by a lot of protesters, keep my boss out of my bedroom. It's none of his business, even if he has religious reasons. Um, at the other, on the other hand, there was a very strong push for religious freedom uh, coming from the Alliance for Defending Freedom and the ACLJ. They, they prompted a lot of this. And you see this huge opposition to the HHS mandate, it was called, and the call to stand up for religious freedom. You saw a lot of religious evangelicals really on the defensive in response to the contraceptive mandate.
Well, finally it happened. Class action lawsuit headed up by the big retail store. You might have seen it. Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is like an arts and crafts store and uh, sells all kinds of artsy craftsy stuff. But they are owned and operated by the Green family who are very conservative evangelical, evangelical Christians. And what's funny about the store is that they offer Bible studies for their employees. Uh, they play uh, contemporary Christian music over the intercom. You know you're in a evangelical Christian environment when you walk into Hobby Lobby. And they oppose certain forms of contraception, which they believe, like we said, to be abortifacients. Uh, Hobby Lobby and several other smaller businesses around the country got in on this big class action lawsuit against the contraceptive mandate and brought it to the U.S. Supreme Court. And what did the court rule? I'm sure you know, they ruled for Hobby Lobby. Uh, no, the, an organization like this, even though it's a for-profit retail store, still has freedom of conscience. Now, of course, a lot of critics said, no, 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 businesses don't have rights. People have rights. Individual people have rights. But the court had to say, well, yes, but Hobby Lobby is a corporation of people. It, it's made up of people. It has employees who work for it. They know what they're getting into when they work there. It has you know, management, and of course, the top, it has the Green family, and their business is an expression of their faith. And so they are, as individual people, they are protected, and so too is their business. Okay, so that part of the contraceptive mandate is struck down. What about, though, all of the nonprofit organizations? That's where the Little Sisters of the Poor come in. A charitable organization from, I think, from Colorado, if I remember right. And of course, they're nuns. They don't care about contraception, but they do have lay people who work for them. And the question is, can the federal government force them as an organization, as a nonprofit organization, uh, to cover contraception, which is contrary to church teaching? And so the nuns had their day in court. And just like Hobby Lobby, the Supreme Court ruled in their favor. And so those aspects of the contraceptive mandate were shut down. Now, Obama was careful. He said, look, churches, church organizations and their staff or any religious organization that has like a house of worship, that's fine. They're protected, but not a retail store, not a nonprofit organization. They have lay employees who have this right to contraception just as much as everybody else, women in particular. Uh, but no, the Supreme Court said that it's not just churches and synagogues and mosques. It's also the businesses and the nonprofits that grow out of them. So there's where it stands with that. What happened, though? What, what's the future question? We definitely see this a lot when it comes to free exercise and the public interest and other fundamental rights having, of course, to do with sexuality. There are two fundamental rights that have really been on a collision course. Um, as we've seen the bakers and the florists, uh, Jack Phillips, who we mentioned, uh, going up against these challenges to their businesses when they refuse to cater to same-sex weddings. And, uh, you know, the, the situations vary. In some cases, if you take Jack Phillips, two guys came in and said, hey, we're getting married. We want you to bake us a cake. Phillips said, no, I don't believe you're actually married. You're not actually, you know, marriage can't be between people of the same sex. That's just what I believe. And he was kind of harsh about it. Other situations were different, though. You take the sweet cakes case. That's the bakery window you see there um, in Oregon. They were actually friends with this lesbian couple who came in all the time. They bought, you know, coffee and pastries and they chit chatted and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden they announced, oh, hey, we're getting married. And they had to say, great, we can't cater your wedding. Please understand. And they said, oh, it's OK. We understand. And supposedly there were hugs and tears and, OK, you know, mutual understanding. And they said, oh, we'll recommend another bakery down the street that will do it. And there are all kinds of bakeries that will. And then they were served papers <laughs> by uh, the uh, Oregon uh, Civil Rights Commission. Uh, and it wasn't a lawsuit against them. Instead, it was forcing them to pay a penalty. So, yeah, it varies. And the fact, too, that there are so many businesses out there that actually want to cater to same-sex marriages. When you have restaurants and bakeries and florists and photographers who actively let it be known that they want to cater same-sex marriages because they, are, they, they want to be part of that. Okay, if you have those kinds of businesses out there, why in the world do you need to target Jack Phillips or the Sweet Cakes Bakery or those kinds of uh, businesses? Uh, it seems like there's sort of this pressure to get everybody on the same page and allow no dissent, a lot of the advocates of free exercise claim. So, as we'll see, this definitely is the frontier. Uh, where is it going to lead? 
the court has addressed this in some interesting ways. If you take Jack Phillips' case, it wasn't about free exercise of religion so much as it was coerced speech. Can you force someone to say something they don't actually believe? Um, and that's been the situation with a lot of these cases. Can that really work, though? We shall see in coming years. What about free exercise when it comes to accommodations within institutions? Take the U.S. military. Uh, can a Jewish serviceman wear a yarmulke? The Air Force initially said no. And uh, so what happened? It was challenged in the U.S. Supreme Court, and the court said, uh, yeah, the Air Force is right. However, the Air Force turned right around and agreed to make accommodations for Jews uh, who wanted to wear a yarmulke. So it's interesting the way this often goes, where the court will rule for the institution, uh, but then the institution itself will turn, will turn around and come up with an accommodation. What about Muslims in prison? Uh, in uh, some of these growing Muslim prison fellowships, uh, in the fact that sometimes their work schedule can conflict with their obligation to pray five times a day. Does the prison have to accommodate them? The Supreme Court actually said, no, it doesn't. Uh, don't know what the prison did after that. They probably ended up accommodating. I mentioned a few weeks ago the whole issue of our Sunday closing laws uh, and the fact that there was a huge firestorm in the early republic over whether or not the postal service could run on Sundays. Um, and of course, business leaders said, we need it running, it's part of our business. A lot of religious organizations started petitioning and rallying around Washington, D.C. to shut down the post office on Sunday. But what about local laws? Uh, there were laws in the books as late as the 1980s, still maintaining closing laws in uh, Pennsylvania, statewide had Sunday closing laws, again, not voluntary by businesses, but mandating that they be closed. Well, what does this do to Orthodox Jews? They can't, if they have businesses, if they close Sunday, and their Sabbath is on Saturday, that means they're closed all weekend. They're missing a work day. Plus, if they're the only business in town that's open, if all the Christian businesses are closed on Sunday, they're, they make really great business by being open on Sunday. Uh, what did the Supreme Court say? One of the last Sunday closing laws cases in uh, Broadfield v. Brown. Indeed, Pennsylvania could uh, have such a law. Still, though, Pennsylvania turned around and started carving out exemptions after that. Of course, today, there's no Sunday closing laws anywhere in the United States. But still, uh, the question is, does the state owe an exemption to small insular groups, uh, in this case, Orthodox Jews? One of the most fascinating cases and really important cases to come out of the Supreme Court was the case of Sherbert v. Verner. Adele Sherbert uh, was a Seventh-day Adventist. She was fired from her job for refusing to work on Saturday, the seventh day. So they share the same Sabbath as Jews, uh, this, this uh, small Christian um, denomination. Uh, yeah, terminated from her job. She turned around and filed for unemployment insurance. The state said, no, 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 we can't pay you for uh, losing your job for religious reasons because separation of church and state, all the establishment clause cases. She appealed it up through the federal courts and it arrived in the U.S. Supreme Court and the court turned right around and actually ruled in her favor. This was very tricky because this meant the court contradicted itself. Uh, Justice William Brennan, see him there, said, no, we, we're not because uh, free exercise is more fundamental than non-establishment. And any state that causes someone like Adele Sherbert to forego her religious conscience is unconstitutional. So he wrote in Sherbert, Plainly enough, Appellate's conscientious objection to Saturday work constitutes no conduct prompted by religious principles of a kind which teach, uh, which, which reach the, sorry, within the reach of state legislation. And the state cannot possibly uh, pass laws that prohibit people from getting work, workman's comp for being fired for their religion. That would infringe on their free exercise. If, therefore, the decision of the South Carolina Supreme Court is to withstand Appellate's constitutional challenge, it must be either because her disqualification uh, as a beneficiary represents no infringement by the state or because any incidental burden on the free exercise of the appellate's religion may be justified by a, quote, compelling state interest in the regulation of the subject within which the state's constitutional power to regulate. Compelling state interest. That is the guiding principle of what we know as strict scrutiny. The state can pass laws that infringe on certain fundamental rights if they only if they have a compelling state interest. They must demonstrate, though, their interest in this. Does the state have a compelling state interest in denying Adele Sherbert her unemployment compensation? No. It infringes on her free exercise.
So after Sherbert v. Verner, it was official that the Supreme Court would get actively involved in protecting the free exercise of religion. They would actually be involved in scrutinizing what constituted religion. Do we really want to go there, the court had to ask itself? Well, as we know, after several years of that, the court did a major about face in Oregon v. Smith, which we'll look at actually in the next lecture. But what happened in Oregon v. Smith? Here you have the state of Oregon that uh, has a, a bunch of, a couple guys working for a drug rehab center who suddenly test positive. Why? Because of peyote. Oh, but peyote is a religious drug, they say. And they appeal it, uh, they try to get workman's comp for it, and they appeal it through the, the courts when they're denied. Here, the Supreme Court had to turn around and say, actually, no, we're not going to apply strict scrutiny or compelling state interest to religion anymore. That's completely thrown out. Uh, so that means there really is no more challenge. There really is no free exercise protection under the, under, uh, the, Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court anymore, unless it's a flagrant violation, unless there's a state law that very specifically singles out a group of people. Since Oregon v. Smith in 1990, there's only been one major case that did that, that was the Church of the Lukumi Baba case coming out of Hialeah, city of Hylea in Florida. Uh, this had to do with Santeria, this Afro-Caribbean uh, religious practice, which involves animal sacrifice. The city passed an ordinance uh, outlawing animal sacrifice, claiming it was for health and safety reasons. But notice they didn't outlaw hunting. They didn't outlaw slaughtering animals on your own property for other reasons. No, just religious animal sacrifice. Well, clearly that singles out a group quite distinctly. That's been pretty much the only specific free exercise protection we've seen. So what is the court protecting religion on the basis of now? It's not actually the free exercise clause, but an act of Congress signed into law by Bill Clinton in 1993 the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RFRA. It goes by the nickname RIFRA. This was a federal law that mandated that all the lower federal courts, maybe not the U.S. Supreme Court, but lower federal courts, still had to apply strict scrutiny. Because remember, uh, Congress uh, maintains control over the appeals process in the lower federal courts. Uh, and so this mandated that religion would be protected. If the Supreme Court wouldn't do it, well, then Congress would. Uh, what happened with RIFRA? A few years after that case came along, the Supreme Court actually struck down part of it uh, in the city of Bourne versus Flores in 1997. So in response, it's kind of this battle back and forth between uh, legislative power and the Supreme Court. In response, several states turned around and passed their own version of RIFRA. A lot of these happened through the 2000s and they weren't all that controversial. But as we know, in recent years, especially in the state of Indiana, when Mike Pence was governor, most of the RIFRA laws were passed to protect businesses against, you guessed it, litigation over same-sex marriage. And so uh, it caused this tremendous firestorm in later years, uh, because specifically because of that. So what's next for the free exercise of religion? Many have argued that it really should be reconsidered, that Oregon v. Smith ought to be overturned in the U.S. Supreme Court, that the court ought to uh, go back to its original position of protecting, actively protecting free exercise. We shall see in the coming years if the court considers doing that or if the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is the enduring federal protection, or if the court will sidestep the religious nature of these questions altogether and protect them on the basis of free speech and free press and freedom of assembly. We shall see. But what about the other half of the, the uh, religion clauses in the First Amendment, the first half? That's free exercise. What comes before that? It is, of course, the fact that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. To understand the way this has been interpreted, let's go back to a very important justice on the court appointed by Franklin Roosevelt, Hugo Black. Hugo Black was a longtime senator from Alabama. He was very supportive of New Deal legislation, very supportive of FDR, and, and he was a talented attorney. So FDR appointed him to the U.S. Supreme Court. Little did FDR know that Black, like all Southern politicians, he should have known, was part of that notorious organization across the South. You guessed it, the Ku Klux Klan. And of course, Roosevelt swore up and down he had no idea. Uh, he, wouldn't have, he wouldn't have nominated uh, Black if he knew about this, knew, knew about his affiliation with the Klan. 
some uh, reporter did a little investigating in the South and found out, whoa, the new justice on the Supreme Court is a Klansman. This is outrageous. Can you believe it? Well, what is going to happen? Is Black going to withdraw his nomination and quit the Supreme Court or what? Well, no. Instead, he goes on the air and apologizes. He confesses. Indeed, he was a cluxer, as the, the headline says, but not anymore. He claims that he resigned. Well, some historians did a little poking around recently, and guess what? Hugo Black actually stayed involved with the Klan for quite some time. Although it wasn't necessarily for racial reasons, which seems hard to believe coming from Alabama. Remember, Black was on the Supreme Court when Brown versus Board was handed down and several other civil rights cases that were unanimous decisions. He signed on. Uh, as far as we can tell, Black didn't really have as much of a problem with, with Black people. No, his real problem was with Roman Catholics. Uh, and so Hugo Black was uh, really involved with a lot of the Establishment Clause cases because he was absolutely sure that the Establishment Clause meant separation of church and state. He was the justice who used that phrase for the first time ever as a legal principle in the U.S. Supreme Court. The case was Everson versus Board of Education, 1947. Um, this is widely regarded as the, the case that really got the ball rolling on all of the religion cases. There's a handful of free exercise ones before, like uh, U.S. v. Ballard, but this was the one that really uh, introduced non-establishment and took that phrase, a wall between church and state, as its guiding principle. The state of New Jersey offered vouchers for parents who sent their kids to private schools, including Catholic schools. There was a lawsuit against that. We can't be spending tax dollars for parochial education. It appealed up through the courts and it was accepted by the US Supreme Court and Black said, we have to lay down the principle here. The First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state. That wall must be kept high and impregnable. We cannot approve the slightest breach. But then he did something very confusing. He turned right around and said, but New Jersey has not breached it here. So in other words, it's fine for these parents to use vouchers for their kids to ride the city buses to their Catholic schools. Why in the world did he do this? Why does he lay out all this principle of separation of church and state and suddenly flip around and say, oh, but it's okay here? Well, all Black could say was, stay tuned. <laughs> there are more cases coming. And Black got really involved in all of the really heavy-handed separation cases, especially when it came to public education. The big one that came along in 1962, which showed that Black was serious, uh, was Ingle v. Vital, which we will look at in our cases on the next lecture. But what was it? School prayer is unconstitutional. It's a violation of the wall of separation between church and state. What a shock this was to the country, because school prayer was just standard procedure in a lot of the public schools around the country. And it was very strange, we mentioned this a minute ago, it wasn't viewed as religious, which doesn't make any sense at all. Of course it's religious, they're praying. No, it's because Protestant Christianity was so embedded in the ordinary customs of the country, and especially in education, that no one thought anything of it. Except of course Catholic and Jewish kids, but you know, they lost. Not anymore, not after this case, Engel v. Vital ruled that indeed, there cannot be, there cannot be prayer in the public schools. Okay, what about Bible reading? Um, Abington v. Shemp, uh, they came down soon after. Same thing, uh, you cannot read the Bible in public schools. Uh, okay, you can teach it as literature, you know, it's part of Western civilization, all. okay, that's fine, but you can't teach it as if you, you know, believe it. And what's interesting is the case actually involved a practice where they wouldn't uh, do like a formal Bible study, there would be no comment on the text, Instead, it would just be, we would read it out loud, usually a passage that wasn't all that overtly religious, like from Proverbs, you know, the wise walk in the way of the righteous and the fool goes down to death, you know, that kind of thing. It has nothing to do explicitly with religion. It doesn't say anything about God. It doesn't matter. So too, the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, no, that too is unconstitutional, the Supreme Court ruled. What's the rationale behind this? William Brennan, who agreed very much with Black on a lot of these things, had this to say. The Baltimore and Abington schools offend the First Amendment because they sufficiently threaten in our day those substantive evils, the fear of which our for, uh, fears of which called forth the Establishment Clause. 
But then he says, look, our interpretation of the First Amendment must necessarily be responsive to the much more highly charged nature of religious questions in contemporary society. And here you see a real glimmer of Brennan's living constitutionalism. Uh, if you know anything about his judicial philosophy, he was big on the living constitution. He's like the justice that introduced that idea. But his point is, look, society has evolved. Religion is a much more hot issue today than it was back in the founders era. The founders are irrelevant to this question. A literal quest for the advice of the founding fathers upon, that, upon the issues of these cases seems to me futile and misdirected. We have to look at the way public education is today. If you think about it, that's exactly what Brown versus Board of Education said when it came to racial segregation. So, gotta get with the times. All right, no prayer, no Lord's Prayer, no Bible reading, what can we do? The state of Alabama uh, had a law that mandated a moment of silence where the kids could just sit at their desks and if they wanna pray, they can pray. And if they wanna sit there and twiddle their thumbs, they can do that too. A moment of silence, doing not doing something, but doing nothing. Well, a guy named Ishmael Jaffrey brought suit against this moment of silence in the state of Alabama and said, this is a violation of the establishment clause. He was an atheist. He uh, really uh, was deeply offended by, by uh, public expressions of religion, especially in public schools where his daughter was mandated to go, he kind of sued on behalf of his daughter. Uh, so yeah, he's an, he's an atheist. Wanna guess who Wallace is in Wallace v. Jaffrey? You guessed it, Alabama governor, George Wallace, the guy famous for standing in the schoolhouse door for resisting de racial desegregation. He was the governor at the time and worked with the state legislature to pass the moment of silence law. What's going on here? This is one of those only in America cases, uh, a black atheist and a segregationist governor on opposite sides of a religious liberty case. Wallace, it turns out, uh, even though he'd been this staunch segregationist, he ran for president again, remember not in 1968, but in 1972 uh, for the Democratic Party at that time, was denied the nomination and went to George McGovern. And while he was campaigning, he was shot by a would-be assassin. It paralyzed him. He spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. He claims, though, that while he was recovering, he had a vision from Jesus Christ. And Jesus told him that all of his racism was a horrible sin and you had to let it all go. And as he recovered, he did. He met with former civil rights leaders. He apologized and went on to become governor, went back to governor of Alabama and completely renounced all of his former racial views on segregation. And then he signed into law the moment of silence bill. The other really unusual thing about this case is that for the first time in its history, the Supreme Court tried to establish the meaning of a law, not on its face. They didn't just look at the statute. Instead, they dug up the legislative record they looked at the record of the debates in the Alabama State Assembly, and sure enough, there it was. Members of all kinds of religious organizations saying this will be a way to bring prayer back into the schools in defiance of Ingleby Vital. Not so fast, said the Supreme Court, and they struck down the moment of silence. So, fascinating case, all kinds of complicated historical uh, aspects to this. But still, the Supreme Court stands firm. Uh, separation means separation, and that is that. Those advocating for strict separation haven't always won. Uh, there was the challenge to In God We Trust on the money. Madeline Murray O'Hare, who we mentioned earlier, a uh, radical atheist organization, tried to challenge this. The court had to say, you know, look, it's it's part of our civil religion. Uh, you know, that's, that's the way it was understood back in Dwight Eisenhower's era and before. Um, so, okay, it, it's fine. There's nothing religious about it. It doesn't violate the First Amendment. Oh, come on, a lot of people said. You're really sidestepping the question. A couple of cases, too. Marsh v. Chambers and Town of Greece versus Galloway challenged the role of chaplains in state assemblies or, in another case, in a city council. Can we have chaplains in these otherwise secular political institutions, the ones that make our laws? There's never been a challenge to the congressional chaplain, or I think there was, but the court threw it out. Uh, but as far as local government, can we have chaplains? Well, same thing. Much like in God We Trust, congressional, uh, you know, assembly chaplains and, and city council chaplains are part of the civil religion. 
And though they might do explicitly religious things, it's not really religion per se, it's civil religion. It's just part of the culture. Then came one of the most intriguing cases, and I'm surprised the book didn't mention this. The case of Michael Newdow. Uh, he's a California uh, physician and an attorney. Uh, so he's a pretty successful guy. He's also an atheist. And he was very upset that there, uh, there it is in the Pledge of Allegiance, we talked about it earlier, under God, that had been put in the Pledge of Allegiance under Dwight Eisenhower's administration in 1957, originally as an anti-communist principle, originally as a way of asserting American freedom. And like we said before, it was also Eisenhower's sneaky way of sidestepping Joe McCarthy. But all that's, you know, history. Who cares? What is under God doing there, says, says Michael Newdow. And so he brought suit in the federal courts and appealed it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And then he did something really remarkable. He actually represented himself as the petitioner in the U.S. Supreme Court. You just don't do that, like, ever. You don't even do that in a criminal trial. You definitely don't do it in the Supreme Court. Michael Newdow did, and he nailed it. His presentation was spectacular. He just knew every single precedent. And no, by, by nailing it didn't mean he was right. He just meant, I just meant that he knew the, the court's own precedents, and based on those precedents, under God, had to be removed from the Pledge of Allegiance by federal, by, by federal law. Well, what happened? The Supreme Court threw his case out. Why? Because he didn't have legal custody of his daughter following the divorce with his wife. Oh, come on, everybody said. The court is completely dodging the question here. So they threw the case out. We shall see, though, if Michael Newdow manages to uh, bring it to the court again, if he can actually claim damages, if he has standing to sue. What are some of the other cases, though, having less to do with uh, religious words? What about religious symbols? One of the most interesting set of cases to come out of the court has to do with Christmas time and the nativity scene. There's baby Jesus surrounded by the three wise men and the shepherds and Mary and Joseph and an angel in a public space, in a public park. You put it on your front lawn, okay, that's your private property, whatever. But in a public park? No way. And so the case came before the U.S. Supreme Court. Can we stand for this under the Establishment Clause? Lynch v. Donnelly in 1984, the Supreme Court took a serious look at it and said, ah, no, uh, that is indeed religious. That's Christianity at the expense of other religious expressions. However, if uh, the nativity scene is part of a bigger picture of religion, say Santa Claus, Santa Claus is secular, there he is with his reindeer, there he is reading a book, okay, that neutralizes the religious content of the nativity scene. Now, of course, there's some wonderful historical irony in that. Where does Santa Claus come from anyway? Wasn't he St. Nicholas back in the 5th century? A very important saint in the early church who was present at the Council of Nicaea, who was known for giving presents to children. He was a Christian saint. Oh, never mind. He's a secular symbol, the Supreme Court said. And so is Frosty the Snowman. So if they are sitting next to the nativity scene, that neutralizes the religious content uh, and makes it less religious. Later cases, though, get trickier. Allegheny County versus Greater, Greater Pittsburgh ACLU uh, had to deal with the question, oh, what if Santa Claus is sitting too far away? What if Frosty the Snowman is several yards over here and the nativity scene is several yards over there? How close does Santa have to be to baby Jesus before baby Jesus ceases to be religious? This is when you just lose your mind reading these cases. This is a case where every single justice on the court wrote either a concurring or dissenting opinion disagreeing over how close Santa Claus has to be to the nativity scene. Uh, as the deliberations were going on, some prankster just set up a nativity scene right in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, which I thought was a hilarious move. But um, so... The religious symbols cases carry on for quite some time, though, and they follow the similar logic, but you, re you realize that it is a very hazy logic. It doesn't really give you a lot of guidance. What about the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have, thou shalt have, uh, uh, sorry, uh, no false gods before me. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. You get these very clearly religious commandments, but then you get others like don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't covet. Those things are secular in purpose. 
Well, the question came out of Texas, Van Orden v. Perry. Perry, in the case, was Governor Rick Perry, uh, a guy who walked past the Ten Commandments in front of the Texas, uh, Texas uh, State Assembly there in Austin uh, and got really upset the fact that the Ten Commandments were there and brought suit uh, before the U.S. Supreme Court saying that this was a violation of uh, the Establishment Clause. He himself uh, was an atheist and he was offended at this religious symbol, appealed it up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and guess what the court ruled? No, no, no. The Ten Commandments are not religious, especially if they're an environment surrounded by a statue of Davy Crockett and all kinds of Texas folklore, as, of course, the State Assembly was. Okay, that neutralizes its religious content. Got that? That's permissible. That's okay. That doesn't violate uh, separation of church and state. The same day, you had the case of McCreary County versus ACLU coming out of Kentucky, having to do with the Ten Commandments that was a plaque on the wall of a local courthouse, trying to emphasize the way that the Ten Commandments fit with our whole legal tradition going way, way back. Well, the challenge initially came, uh, you know, take it down, violates uh, non-establishment. In response, the courthouse and the local city put up a whole bunch of other documents. How about the Code of Hammurabi? How about, you know, Magna Carta and you know, all kinds of secular documents that had less to do with religion? That would, again, neutralize the content of the, re of, uh, the religious Ten Commandments. Nope, it said, the U.S. Supreme Court said, that's different because it's inside a courthouse. Ten Commandments in front of a state house, that's different because it's out in public. If you're inside, it's more coercive. Does that make sense? Ten Commandments outside, okay. Ten Commandments inside, not okay. And so the Ten Commandments was removed and the courthouse replaced it with this plaque that said here formerly sat the ten commandments what's going on here is the court really giving us a lot of guidance on how to understand the religion clauses it gets trickier one of the most important cases to come along was the lemon v kurtzman case having to do with uh, whether or not religious schools were eligible for public funds for things like textbooks and microscopes for the laboratory. You know, is that permissible? And the court did not want to apply the strict separation principle. So instead it came up with the lemon test. Warren Berger, chief justice at the time, was really big on tests. If you study constitutional law, he, was, he came up with all kinds of tests. None of them worked, but he did it anyway. Here is the lemon test. The statute must have a secular legislative purpose. Okay. Uh, second point, the principle or primary effect of the statute must neither advance nor inhibit religion. So really he's laying out kind of principles of neutrality, the neutral relationship between uh, church and state. Third, the statute must not result in a quote, excessive entanglement, government entanglement with religion. Does that work? Do we see that working? The lemon test was applied just a handful of times in later religion cases, and then it just kind of fell apart. Of course, a lot of critics said, why didn't you just stick with strict separation between church and state instead of trying to manage the relationship? The lemon test. More common, though, than that has, of course, been endorsement. The major case uh, dealing with this was Levy Weissman in 1992. There was a graduation ceremony, a public school district. And the superintendent uh, wanted to have a prayer, just really wanted to have a prayer. And a lot of the people there agreed with him. But he wanted to make sure that it was a generic prayer, a prayer that was more attuned to civil religion. So how about this? Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. And it was prayed by a rabbi to show this sort of broad religious inclusion. It didn't matter to... Uh, the Weissman family. Deborah Weissman and her dad were deeply offended by this prayer, and they told the superintendent, we are going to sue you if you do this, and they got an attorney, and he did it anyway. So they brought suit against the superintendent of the school district and appealed it up, up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, the thing about this, this is a graduation ceremony. It's voluntary, right? You, you still get your degree, you know, with, so what's the big deal? Well, the Supreme Court pointed out that this endorses religion. Sure, maybe not a particular religion, you know, good job for trying to be neutral, but it endorses religion all the same. Uh, the Weissmans are atheists. By putting 
Deborah Weissman in this crowd of students who are all praying, it puts pressure on her to believe in a God that her conscience does not allow her to believe in. So he backtracks. He says, look, our decisions in Engel, the school prayer case, in Abington, the uh, Bible reading case, recognize, among other things, that prayer exercises in public schools carry a particular risk of indirect coercion. Right? You force the non-believer to believe in that environment. The coercion may not be limited to the context of schools, but it, mo but it is most pronounced there. What to most believers may seem nothing more than a reasonable request that a non-believer respect their religious practices in a school context may appear to the non-believer or dissenter to be an attempt to employ the machinery of the state to enforce religious orthodoxy. Here you see Kennedy turning to psychology, the feelings and the sort of atmospheric coercion forced onto people who wish to not believe and making them believe. Then we get the long twists and turns and complicated questions about public funding for the schools. After Lemon V. Kurtzman falls apart, uh, all these questions come up. Okay, uh, textbooks going to religious schools, even if they're just like math books, can't be funded with public tax dollars. That violates the Establishment Clause. But what if the books are donated free from a public school that isn't using them anymore? Or what if they're given on loan from a public school? Okay, that's all right. The court just flip-flops all over the place on these questions. What about, okay, the city transit system is one thing, but what about just the yellow school buses? Can't they just be dropped off at a religious school? Uh, that's, no, that's that's wrong. But they can ride the city transit. They can get a voucher for that. So pretty, pretty soon after a while, you start to feel like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with your Ten Commandments, meandering through the maze of the wall between church and state. The court just flip-flops all over the place. And the more you look at these cases, the more you start to feel like they are not deciding them on any kind of legal principle. This is all about guessing. They're practically tossing a coin. You never know how the court is going to come down on certain questions. And the uh, Establishment Clause cases get very confusing and muddled over time. What, though, is the bigger question having to do with school choice? Very hot issue in education policy these days, especially the question of vouchers, and the possibility that uh, parents might get tax credits back to put toward the tuition for private schools that would otherwise go to the public schools. So that way, if they do send their kids to a private school, they don't pay tuition twice, one through tax dollars, one through tuition to the school. Uh, so yeah, voucher programs then. The first state to introduce this was Ohio, and a few other states have followed suit. Current Education Secretary Betsy DeVos has been, been proposing a national voucher program. That hasn't gone anywhere. She's looking at major pushback from teachers' unions. Ohio did it, though, because a lot of the Ohio public schools were just a disaster. And by 2002, early, early 2000s, Ohio said, we should not subject our kids to this anymore. Let's give them vouchers. And so the concept of vouchers is basically that the failing schools, kids shouldn't have to suffer through those failing schools. They can go take their voucher to another school. And then the kids who stay in the failing public schools, there are fewer, and so they get better attention, and maybe the public school can get their act together. A lot of people really objected to this, though, especially the teachers' unions, because guess who's choosing the public, the, the voucher schools? It's predominantly upper-middle-class white kids. But then it turned out, actually, who's really choosing those schools? African-American families. Oh, now what? Now let's challenge it on First Amendment grounds. The separation of church and state is violated with these vouchers because most of the schools that the kids are choosing, as even black families, tend to be religious schools. In response to this, in Zelman versus Simmons Harris in 2002, uh, it really became sort of a mix of free exercise and civil rights. Vouchers are very popular among black families, especially in Ohio, who really wanted to get their kids out of these disastrous failing public schools and make sure they get an education and get a leg up on life and success in their future. And guess who was guess who the court ruled for? For the vouchers. This was not public funding for religion. This was public funding for parents who just happened to choose religious schools out of their own choice. 
Some of them did choose secular private schools, but most of them chose religious ones. And so uh, school choice was upheld on these grounds. So let's dig into some of the arguments next time uh, when it comes to religious liberty. Let's look at the cases. Uh, you see them listed on the syllabus. You can also just look at the introduction of the, uh, the book. Let's look at the cases, starting with the Mormon polygamy case, the Jehovah's Witness cases, and a handful of others next time and look at the legal reasoning over the tension between free exercise of religion and non-establishment. See you then.